Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Chris Dobson, and I am Action Project's lead here at World Affairs. So if you enjoy today's discussion and are interested in learning more, I'll be around after the program, and I'd be more than happy to share about our um, developing action projects if you want to come up and introduce yourself to me. Now, I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Christy Chin. Christy has devoted her career to advancing social entrepreneurship and championing high-impact philanthropy. While serving in leadership roles at the Skoll, Hewlett, and Draper Richards Kaplan Foundations, Christy regularly attended and participated in World Affairs programs. She also served on the World Affairs Board recently. Today, Christy serves on five nonprofit boards, two of which, Food Forward and Save the Waves, are active in climate action. I would now like to turn it over to Christy to begin our conversation. Someone's a little taller than me, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. I just wanted to say a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, you've taken one step by coming tonight to combat climate change, and we hope that we can inspire you to take more steps, in fact, to take action. Um, World Affairs has moved from conversations that matter into conversations and actions that matter. And so we hope that we will inspire you to take action. It's my pleasure to be um, moderating a discussion with three incredible women. And the late and great uh, Madeline Albright would say that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help women. Um, and that was recently quoted um, upon her passing. Well, if that's true, then there's a special place in heaven for these three extraordinary women because of the number of women that they're helping. So it's my pleasure to make these introductions today. Um, so our first um, two speakers are uh, a dynamic duo, a grandmother and granddaughter. Paolo uh, John Turco uh, is joining us. Um, over the past 24 years, she has served as a photojournalist documenting women's lives in over 62 countries. Wow, what a travel agenda. Um, she's published six books to date. Many of her books, by the way, are on YouTube, if you want, or talks about the books. Um, and she is inspiring, inspiring, women, inspiring readers to support women around the world. All of her books um, are benefit philanthropic projects. And this book, Cool, 100% of those donations will go to the Women's Earth Alliance, which you'll hear much more about today. Her accolades include uh, being one of the 40 women under 40 to watch, um, and Women's E! News named her one of 21 leaders for the 21st century. In 2017, the YWCA inducted her into the Marin Women's Hall of Fame. Thrilled to have you here. She's joined by her, her granddaughter uh, and co-author of the book, uh, Cool, Avery S Salster, um, is, has interviewed and photographed women leaders across the United States and Tanzania, and she'll tell you more about that today. She's also obviously passionate about reversing climate change, and climate warming, and has mobilized her classmates to create an environmental website. Avery's invitation to action is the last chapter of the book. I hope you'll get to that, and um, I hope it is a powerful call for all of us to do everything that we can to end the climate crisis. So with that, I'll turn it over to our two dynamic duo. Happy Earth Day Eve. <laughs> Women leaders all over the world are showing us the path to a more sustainable future. They are creative and energetic and effective. In fact, our upcoming book, Cool, tells the story of 27 of those leaders in 10 countries, countries as far flung as Denmark and Sri Lanka. There are 
there is at least one and maybe two of those women leaders in the room with us tonight. Is Chrissy Kiefer here? I haven't seen her yet. She was hoping to come. If she comes, um, she's the leader of the Dance Mission Theater here in San Francisco. And the other one is Melinda Kramer, whom you will hear more about and from in a little while. Uh, Melinda is the leader of an organization called the Women's Earth Alliance. More on that later. And now, please meet my granddaughter and co-author, Avery Sangster. We began thinking about this book because we noticed that almost everyone is aware of the wildfires, droughts, floods, and the unbearable heat that global warming is causing. But people still avoid taking action to stop the climate crisis. For a lot of people, the subject seems too scientific and complicated to understand. Or it seems too big for one person to do anything about. Or it seems too political to discuss. Or too scary. I'm going to try to change that tonight. Our dream for our book, Cool, is that the women's leaders' stories will demystify global warming and inspire readers to take action. This evening, we hope to inspire you to take action to start reversing global warming and cool the earth. So, what is global warming, and how does it work? When I was in fourth grade, I learned about the water cycle. Simply put, rain falls and flows through rivers to collect in lakes and oceans. There, the water evaporates and forms clouds, which then make rain again. Simple. For humans to live happily, this cycle must be in balance. Too little rain and it's a drought. Too much rain and there's a flood. The carbon cycle is similar. Carbon dioxide is actually a good thing. It's necessary for life on Earth. Carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants and later released back into the atmosphere when each plant decomposes. Oceans, lakes, and streams also can absorb carbon dioxide. This nature balance between just enough CO2 in the air, but not too much, lasted for millions of years until we, big-brained humans, discovered how to release the energy in carbon by burning gas, oil, and coal. Burning those fossil fuels releases more car carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than, it, than, than the environment can absorb. The extra carbon emissions trap the sun's heat, creating global warming. We are all responsible for global warming. This isn't about selfish corporations, evil politicians, or powerful lobbyists pushing bad laws. No, we all participate. Think about the vehicle that transported you here tonight, the lights overhead that now allow us to meet after dark, the clothes we're wearing that were shipped around the world. We are all contributing to the CO2 imbalance. If we continue as we live today, the Earth will no longer support the life we know. We interviewed one leader who stopped talking mid-sentence and looked at my grandmother with an expression of uncertainty. She realized that she was talking about the end of our species and it could sound really scary to 11-year-old me. <laughs> I'm not paralyzed with fear. I'm inspired by the women I met while we were making this book. They're actually making change, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so can you. In a few minutes, we're going to tell you some of their stories. Decreasing the greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming will take all of us working together. Policymakers, businesses, corporations, nonprofits, academics, individuals. Why focus on women, people ask me. Cool will be my seventh book, as you heard, about women activists around the globe. I tell their stories because too often women's stories go untold. But this time, there was something else. New research suggests that women are more effective at improving the environment. That's true for government with women's leaders, companies with women in charge, women who lead investment firms. And that means that women leaders' climate actions make them good role models for all of us. Avery and I started to work on this book with great excitement. Imagine, your company is counting on you to invent sustainably sourced plastics to replace the petroleum-based plastics they relied on for 60 years to manufacture what Fortune magazine named the toy of the century. 
And your company, which has been identified as having the best corporate reputation in the world, has decided to make its products 100% sustainable by 2030. Are you up for it? <laughs> it's my dream job, Nelaki Vanderpool told us. She's the chemical engineer who's vice president of materials at Lego Corporation. Nelaki admits, what I've always liked about chemistry is solving difficult challenges. Doing something good for the planet is important to me. It's great that I can do this with an organization that delights children and adults across the world. Nelaki says, Lego wants to leave the planet in the best possible shape for kids. Our owners have made this a strategic priority. Nelaki works at Lego's corporate headquarters in Denmark. Lego's suppliers develop the new plastics under her supervision. Nelaki's lab is the place where new bioplastics are tested for color, shininess, durability, and other qualities, all of which must be the same as Lego's high-quality conventional plastics. In 2018, the company introduced an entire Lego set made from sugar-based plastic, sugar cubes. The set, which included trees and shrubs, was called Plants from Plants. Plants from Plants included more than 80 shapes, but Nelaki points out that Lego makes something like 4,000 shapes. We need to reinvent replacement for more than 20 types of plastic. When they're ready, we'll substitute them into our sets. You won't be able to tell the difference. The suppliers who develop new bioplastics with Lego can license them to manufacturers who make many different kinds of products. Nelaki told us, by changing our behavior, we enable our suppliers, other customers, to take advantage of our efforts. Then she smiled. You're about to meet an Inuit leader. Her name is Sheila Watt Cloutier. She was president of Canada's Circumpolar Council. She was also led the council's international work in Russia, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. She earned so many awards for her activism that the, to list them takes three pages on Wikipedia, on Wikipedia and she's featured on a Canadian postage stamp. Climate change is causing the Arctic to warm twice as fast as the rest of the planet. So in Sheila's village, buildings buckle, houses sink, runways crack, the coast is eroding, snowmobiles have fallen through the ice. The impacts are not merely physical, or they are also cultural. Hunting is a cornerstone of the Inuit culture. But the animals, and the marine mammals that the Minuit hunt for food and clothing are also struggling. Snow and ice represent mobility, she told us. Sheila grew up traveling by dog sled. When mobility starts to wane, everything becomes precarious, she said. We are the sentinels, she continued. We live at the top of the world, so we're the first, the first to witness the changes that are happening to our planet. We are the scientists in our own right. Western scientists say they've learned from our hunters. The marriage of their science and our traditional knowledge has been groundbreaking. Indigenous wisdom is the medicine we seek to create a more sustainable world. In her book, Sheila writes, our shared atmosphere and oceans, not to mention our human spirit, unites us all. It's important that climate change is not framed as just an economic, scientific, or political issue. It's a human issue. Sheila continues, I urge people to move from their heads to their hearts, where all change happens, and to know that change provides an opportunity to flourish in the future and to create a better world but we need to act. Mother Earth is a living, breathing entity, Sheila says. When you're out in nature, you can sense that Mother Earth is reaching her limits. Just outside Arusha, Tanzania, we picked up Juliette Molel, the Maasai woman we were going to visit. She'd taken a two-hour boda boda, that's a motorcycle taxi, to help us find her house because there were no road names, signs, or house numbers most of the way. Getting there was like skiing on moguls. At first, the road was bumpy with chunks of rocks. Then it was unpaved and rutted. 
Then the road ended, but we kept on going. I was about to discover why the NGO Solar Sister works with last mile communities. Fatma Muzo, Solar Sister's Tanzania country director, understands what life is like for women in these communities. Without light, she says, there's no access to quality education or health services. In my home village, there's no electricity, but people are happy now. They have solar. Solar Sister provides solar products to women entrepreneurs in communities where families typically use kerosene, candles, flashlights, or wood fires to light their houses. Solar Sister's most popular product in Tanzania is a portable table lamp that runs off a solar panel. panel. Solar Sister entrepreneurs also sell telephone chargers, home lighting systems, and clean cook stoves, which operate on a solar charger that can be installed outside or on the roof. Fatma says, what I am proudest of is Solar Sister's unique model. Few organizations work with women, and even fewer work with women and energy. Many village women don't have sources of income. If they have a seasonal crop business, they have to wait months to harvest and sell. But if they sell solar, they can earn money every day. Fatma mentioned, we did a survey to measure Solar Sisters' impact, and it showed that our women are being respected and making family decisions. They have the same strong voices as their husbands, and many have been able to become village leaders because they are confident and empowered. Scientists say that mangrove trees absorb five times more carbon dioxide than typical tropical trees like those in the Amazon rainforest. A nonprofit called Sudisa includes women in every village on the border, on the shoreline of Sri Lanka. The women-led community cooperatives include 15,000 women. At all times, each woman is growing 100 mangrove seedlings in her backyard. Every year, they sow 1.5 million seedlings in Sri Lanka's coastal lagoons. Members of the co-op also monitor the mangrove forests and report people, such as shrimp farmers, who try to cut the trees down. Their voices carry weight. Officials respond immediately. One morning, three groups of women from the village of Mundell gathered to plant mangrove trees. We arrived at, they arrived at the lagoon by boat and motorcycle and bicycle. There were Muslim and Tamil and Sinhalese, but despite their differences, they were united by their commitment to the mangrove trees. Wearing bright clothes but barefooted, they embedded the seedlings in the dark silt at the water's edge. And then they rinsed off their hands and feet, rolled out straw mats, opened thermoses, and served us ginger tea in china cups. One more story. As a child, Clover Moore was the leader of a group she named the Scarlet Pimpernels of Neptune. <laughs> the Scarlet Pimpernels of Neptune. She led her classmates on walks through a national park. Now, Lord Mayor Clover Moore leads one of the world's great cities, Sydney, Australia. She is the first woman elected Lord Mayor. She's the longest serving mayor in the city's 179 year history. As a child, the mayor-to-be exhibited two attributes that have served Sydney res residents well. First, an ability to convince people to do what she wanted, to follow her. And second, a passion for her national, natural surroundings, which prompted her as a child to give trees to her parents as birthday presents. When Clover and her husband moved to a South Sydney suburb, in the 1970s, she noticed that the park was a dust-covered concrete slab. When she asked about it, she discovered that South Sydney refused to lay grass because that would mean sweeping up the broken glass was too hard to do. She decided to deal with that. With no political experience and no allies, she ran for local council in 1980 and won, and that led to a series of government positions 
After I was elected mayor in 2004, she says, we discovered that 97% of Sydney residents wanted action on climate change. So we committed to reducing emissions in the local government by 70% by 2030. We have planted more than 13,000 trees. We've installed more than 4,000 rooftop solar panels. We have changed street lights to LED bulbs. We have upgraded the city's fleet to hybrid and electric vehicles, and we've added bike lanes. There are all ways that they've sought to reduce, to address climate change, and they have proved effective. She told us, we were Australia's first local government to be certified carbon neutral. That was the year 2011. If you're like me, you immediately can tell that 2011 is a long way from 2030. The city of Sydney belongs to C40 Cities, a group that shares knowledge and acts together to address the climate crisis. The Lord Mayor says, without urgent, coordinated global action, we face a high risk of runaway climate change. Clover Moore, the girl who gave her parents trees as birthday gifts, now shows the world's other cities how to prevent runaway climate change. Every chapter in the book ends with ideas that leaders suggest readers can do to fight global warming. Each list of ideas is connected via QR code to the project website, which gives details about exactly how to act on those suggestions. If you're online, try using your phone to scan Clover Moore's QR code right now to see the details. If you're not online, <laughs> here's a sneak preview. She says, never, ever stop demanding more from your elected representatives. We added links that will help you do exactly that. You can also access the leader's ideas by going to the project website, which is coolreversingglobalwarming.com. Click on the Act tab, and you'll see all of the women leaders' suggestions for climate action. An overarching observation from our research was that every woman leader used multiple strategies. Think about Clover Moore. She used bike lanes and public transportation and trees and so forth, on and on and on. Inspired by the women leaders' multiple strategies, Avery and I created a climate action plan for our book. First, we offset our airline miles by donating trees to earthday.org's canopy project. Second, we ask our publisher to print using linseed oil and paper that was certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, which is sustainably produced. Third, Avery designed our business cards and had them printed at moo.com, you could too, on paper made from recycled cotton t-shirts. We have arranged to have a tree planted for every book that's sold and last, 100% of our author royalties will go to the Women's Earth Alliance to provide seed funding to women around the world who are starting businesses and nonprofits that aim to help reverse global warming. We're telling you about our climate action plan because we hope you will call a family meeting to create your own family climate action plan with multiple strategies. A Washington Post study last year found that 57% of young people are afraid of climate change. That probably includes your children and grandchildren. Fear that is converted in, into conviction is unstoppable, and there's plenty for all ages to do. You can start by quantifying your family's carbon footprint. Lots of online services do this. We list for some for you on our website. Younger children can pledge to turn off the lights when they leave the room, and older children can ask their school cafeterias to serve more plant-based meals. Parents and grandparents might find, might add solar panels to their roof. They might consider buying an electric car. They might investigate induction stoves or heat pumps. If you're an investor, vote your shares to make corporations more accountable on climate issues. Talk to Andy. Behar, there he is, um, who specializes in exactly that. Everyone who's registered to vote can use their voice and their vote 
and money to support local, state, and federal elected officials who will reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Action begets action. If we act, we'll inspire others to act, and they'll inspire others. We can scale up and create critical mass. Saving our, saving our species, saving our species, is an existential challenge that will take all of us working together, governments, businesses, families. Avery and I look forward to the existential impact that you and we all are about to create together. Cool describes women climate leaders, but lots of men are also doing good work. A few years ago, I met a, ma a Native American named Nick Tilson, who has a long ponytail and wears incredible beaded costumes made by his grandmother. Nick said his tribe doesn't believe people own the earth, but that we are merely caretakers for future generations. I like this perspective. So think about the 11-year-olds in your family. If you want them to know the world you inherited from your grandparents, you must take action for them. Act now, right now. Each of you will find a cool action pack on your chair. We invited organizations in the book to contribute items that would equip you to act immediately. You'll find a guide to climate action, a guide to climate conversations from the Climate Museum in New York. There's a nap time postcard you can write to your elected representatives while your child is sleeping. That comes from the Moms Clean Air Force. These are simple things you can do easily, and you each will officially become climate activists. This obviously isn't enough, but it's a start. And starting is a great way to celebrate. Happy Earth Day! <laughs> Inspiring. I don't know. Melinda, I don't know. <laughs> Hard, tough act to follow here. Uh, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Melinda Kramer. She is an accomplished social entrepreneur, an environmental leader, a fundraiser, watch out, a nonprofit uh, founder, and a director. Uh, she's worked around the globe at the intersection of environmental sustainability, women's economic development, and gender violence, or gender justice. Sorry, sorry, other topics. Uh, and um, in, two, in 2005, she and her colleagues set out to bridge the resource gap for grassroots women who are tackling the world's most critical environmental and climate challenges. That began with a small convening of 30, international, 30 women leaders from 26 countries. It grew into the Women's Earth Alliance which is now a 16-year-old international organization. It's a thriving network uh, globally that trains and elevates the critical work of grassroots women, entrepreneurial and climate leaders around the world. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Melinda, who also is the co-board uh, chair for Regeneration.org. Thanks. Thank you so much. So wonderful to be here. I am Melinda Kramer. I'm the co-founder and co-director of Women's Earth Alliance. And I'm so excited to start by sharing a very short video animation with you, which you would think was created for Paola and Avery and their <laughs> book. Um, even the narrator sounds like you, Paola. But we created this video because we wanted to imagine from the future backwards. And it starts with a grandmother speaking to her, her grandchild about um, the story that will unfold. Grandmother, tell me about when you were a little girl. Well, my dear, Long ago, in the early part of the 21st century, many had forgotten that human life and the earth upon which it depends are precious. The careless ways of humankind polluted the air, the water, the food, the land, and our bodies and minds. In these times, women bore the greatest burdens. With dignity, we took on the essential acts of tending the land and collecting water, though our lives and livelihoods were constantly threatened. And while the wisdom that was needed to heal the earth had been in our bones for ages, even that precious knowledge was ignored by those who claimed to know what was best for us. Mm -hmm. 
Moved by this wisdom, 30 women from around the world came together. Each woman understood the problem of having too little or the problem of having too much, and they began to weave a new story. A story of women leaders transforming their own communities, sharing resources and restoring balance upon the earth. A story rooted in the undeniable fact that when women thrive, communities thrive. In this story, our wisdom was respected, and those who wished to help began to listen. We recognized our interdependence, exchanging solutions like gifts. Around the globe, women joined hands and the story took root. They hosted trainings, learned sustainable technologies, and taught others. People across regions stepped forward in support. Speaking out, their message was heard. They shared knowledge and linked strategies. Real change blossomed as communities took action to advocate, innovate, and preserve. We began to remember the preciousness of the simple things like water, land, and seeds. We remembered to work together. We remembered our real power. After this long journey, we now stand safely on the land in balance, men and women together, caring for each other with visionary solutions, preserving the earth for those who will follow. We have finally come home. Can you imagine it? I want to start with a little story from 2001 when I was attending the University of Nairobi in Kenya and I learned that a woman named Dr. Wangari Mathai would be giving a guest lecture and of course I had no idea that she would go on to be the Nobel Peace Prize laureate. I went to hear her speak about her incredible campaign, the Green Belt Movement to mobilize Kenyan women to plant trees, which would eventually lead to the planting of more than 51 million trees in Africa, engaging nearly 900,000 women with economic opportunities. And I can still remember it. I walked up to her after her speech, and I thanked her for her leadership. And at the end of our conversation, she said to me, what we need to do is simple. Just plant seeds, seeds of all kinds. You'll be amazed at how they grow. And then she just flashed me this radiant smile, and I could see that resolve in her eyes. And little did I know I would see that same resolve in hundreds of eyes in my life, hundreds of women's eyes. I went on to become trained in anthropology and environmental policy and international development, traveling around the world, working in rural and urban areas from Alaska to China to Tanzania to the Russian Far East, but I'd come to find no better set of instructions than those shining out from the eyes of a woman leader. It's really true. And I'd quickly learned that if I was committed to protecting the environment, there would be no better strategy to achieve that than to work with women leaders. I discover that at the heart of every environmental and climate fight in communities around the world are women rolling up their sleeves, showing up, committed for the long haul, for the sake of their families and their communities, for the sake of the earth itself, and for the future generations that would inherit it all. And so fast forward to 2006, 16 years ago, when we launched the Women's Earth Alliance. And as you saw, we did so by convening 30 women from 26 countries, all of whom were working on environmental and climate issues. Our invitation was simple, just to come together to be part of designing a global initiative that would connect and resource and catalyze the work of women working so hard to protect the environment. There was Patti Luis Corso, a former school teacher turned conservation activist who uses singing to inspire her followers and who's taken on both the Mexican government and big corporations to stop the exploitation of the biodiverse, beautiful Sierra Gorda native forests. 
There was Kaisha Atakanova, a biologist whose country was dealing with a 40-year legacy of nuclear testing, and people were getting sick and uh, dying of cancer. And Kaisha led a national, nationwide campaign to stop nuclear waste from being commercially imported uh, into her country. And so for all of us, this wasn't going to be about meeting quotas for women's representation or women as target beneficiaries of massive international development schemes. We'd all seen that before. This was about meeting an urgent resource gap. As Paola said, you know, we all observe the same thing. Even though our contexts were different, women were underrepresented in decision making, unrecognized often in the media, and under-resourced in every way compared to their male counterparts. And the worst part, we, I heard it again and again, women feeling so alone, cut off from each other, doing this work without the solidarity of a network. And yet women were making things happen, they were strategic and resourceful and, and collaborative, and so we asked ourselves, what would the world look like if women protecting the earth were supported and united? And today, WIA answers that question. In some of the most environmentally threatened places in the world, WIA leaders are protecting and defending forests and rivers. They're saving threatened indigenous seeds, key to our food security and survival. They're launching regenerative farms. They're conserving coral reefs and mangroves. And they're protecting indigenous land rights and lifeways. Since 2006, WIA has equipped over 12,000 women with technical, entrepreneurial, and leadership training and skills. And in turn, the ripple effect these leaders have reached over 13 million people in 24 countries with tangible solutions, safe water, clean energy, regenerative farming, climate change resilience. We often talk about our work, it, our work is not charity, it's reciprocity. We link leaders across regions to build a power base of voices, of solutions, and of care. And we know this story goes far back. For generations, women have been the caretakers of communities, providing food, water, energy, shelter, caring for our children, our elders, caring for our households. And all of these responsibilities are impacted by the climate crisis. And that's because climate change is a threat multiplier. It exacerbates all of these existing structural inequities that we see and we know are there. It, it means that as ecological crises intensify, women and girls, particularly women and girls of color, are hit the hardest. They're more exposed to economic instability, displacement when there's a crisis, an emergency, um, violence, death. Despite being most impacted, um, women make up only 30% of global and national climate decision-making bodies. And this number always shocks me. Women-led environmental programs and organizations like the ones that you're hearing about receive only 0.2% of philanthropic funds. And so we uh, exist to, like I said, bridge this resource gap because we know that when women have the tools, the training, the resources, the networks, and the decision-making power in their hands, everyone benefits. Women are empowered, children are safer, communities are healthier, natural resources regenerate, local economies prosper, and real change takes root, like we saw in that video. I remember at the start of the pandemic, when things were looking pretty grim, I reached out to my longtime colleague, Rose Wamalwa, and she is the East Africa Program Director for, for WIA, and I called her to discuss strategy, and she said, you know, with malaria, Locust outbreaks and years of floods and droughts, we are no stranger to crisis here. And then she went on to tell me that we can't wallow. We can't sit around and wait for someone else to solve the problem. And she said, we were made for this moment and we are ready to act. And she hadn't hesitated to make her small office a food distribution center. Her team was distributing food within days of the pandemic's beginnings and supplies to the most vulnerable through her networks of local women leaders already well versed in disaster response in water, sanitation, hygiene, and even climate smart agriculture. So this is the spirit of our global alliance that we are made for this and we can't wait. 
We a leader, Rebecca Jim of the Cherokee Nation, she didn't wait when she found out that there, I, there was iron and zinc mining in her hometown of Oklahoma, and it was contaminating the water and poisoning her community. She organized and lobbied and built awareness, worked with students, got them involved, until the EPA finally announced a five-year, $16 million plan to clean up her region. I think of WEA leader Camille Hadley, who didn't wait for healthy, accessible food options to arrive in her town in South Florida, which is a USDA register designated food desert where there's a large child hunger and homelessness issue. And starting with a few plants in pots on her porch and growing from there, Camille's organization, Little Growers, now produces healthy food, local jobs, and offers hundreds of kids programming in farming and climate resiliency and STEM education. And you can only imagine how important Camille's work is during, was during, the, during COVID when people were struggling more than ever. So we talk about climate resilience. This is resilience. I think about WEA leader June Farmer from Marin City. Didn't wait for authorities to deal with her city's chronic flooding, worsening every year with climate change and sea level rise. With water literally at her doorstep at times, June and her community didn't wait for outside consultants to do what she knew would be a pricey assessment, but instead they began creating a climate people's plan, mapping out how to mitigate flooding with permaculture and other techniques. And they created a plan that was rooted in their understanding of where they live, what assets they have, what they need. And now they're organized and they're more ready to withstand the challenges of flooding or any other challenge that comes their way. So, but it's a lot on our world's women, right? There was a headline, I remember it, in New York Times last year, potentially, um, that said, women are the shock absorbers of the pandemic. And we know this is painfully true. Women are losing income, losing jobs. They took on schooling, kept people healthy all over the world. And women are also the, the, the shock absorbers of the climate crisis, carrying the burden on our shoulders, on our backs, on our heads, right, in some cases, disproportionately every day in every region of the world. But we are also, as author Paul Hawken likes to say, we are the Earth's immune system. I mean, can you imagine a future like the one in the video animation that I showed? You know, can you imagine if women had what we need to nurse our planet back to health? And so that's what we are doing here. And regardless of what the next crisis will be, because we're guaranteed to face them, we feel as though we are here, made for this moment, and ready to act. So all those years ago when Wangari Mathai spoke to me about planting seeds, I couldn't have imagined that the seed she planted in my heart would someday grow into this global alliance of action. And none of us can really predict exactly how the seeds we plant today will grow into abundance for future generations. But I know that when we invest in women, when we support the seed tenders, the knowledge keepers, the caregivers, when we share their stories and invest in their solutions, we know life has a chance to flourish. Thank you. It looks like I'm live, thanks. Great. Um, well, what, an ins what inspiring and optimistic um, stories we're hearing today. I think so often when Earth Day comes around, you hear about all the problems that we're facing and challenges. Um, so it's really inspiring to hear about the positive efforts. I also um, neglected to say a big thank you to Chris um, from World Affairs um, and also his colleague, Joy, um, both of whom um, helped us all get ready today. So um, I just wanted to express my appreciation to the World Affairs team. Thank you so much. So Melinda, can I start with you? You talked a lot about the powerful role that women are playing around the solution. Can you talk a little bit more about women and their relationship with the environment? and the linkages there? Yeah, I, I touched on it. Some of the statistics are quite stunning. Um, I, I may have mentioned that women and girls make up 80% of the world's climate refugees. And this also means that they are 14 times more likely to die in a climate-related disaster than men. We saw this in 2004, for example, when a tsunami struck Sri Lanka, 
and it was later recorded that four times as many women died in the wake of this disaster. And these are those structural inequities that I talked about that put women in more vulnerable positions. Um, and we also know that women face greater health and safety risks um, around water and sanitation. When that becomes compromised, women are walking long distances, and that means they're putting themselves to, at the threat of violence. So they might be missing a chance to get an education or, or a job. Um, and when communities are destroyed in climate disasters, women are, of course, more likely to lose their jobs and sink into poverty. Um, and so, the UN reported that when the same resources and inputs, when, when given the same resources and inputs as men, women farmers can incre increase production by 30 to 40%. So this is the flip side. It's like when we do invest in women in this position who are most impacted and best positioned to have an impact, we see incredible um, results. Um, women, where women have higher social and political status, their countries have 12% lower CO2 emissions and more protected land areas than in countries where they don't. So, you know, I, and a study of 130 countries found that women in government positions, like you had talked about in Australia, are more likely to sign on to international treaties to reduce global warming than men. And when women participate equally with men in politics and policy making, climate policy interventions are more effective. Look at countries like New Zealand, led by Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, with a 40% female cabinet. Um, New Zealand aims to have their public sector carbon neutral in just three years. So um, it's that intersection where women are disproportionately impacted and have an incredible, tremendous opportunity to turn the dial and, and have an impact that will benefit all of us. That's great, thank you. Um, Paolo, I, when I was a program officer at Draper Richards Kaplan or Skoll Foundation, I, we would get you know hundreds of applications and it's so difficult to choose who's the social entrepreneur we're gonna fund, who's the, which grantee are we gonna pick? So how did you go about picking the women leaders that are featured in the cool book? Having granddaughters helps you, you know? <laughs> um, I spent about a year doing research. I must have Googled women climate Afghanistan, women climate Zimbabwe, <laughs> and everything in between. Um, there are a zillion stories that could have been in this book. Um, the way I chose, ultimately, was to look at a book called Drawdown. Do you know Drawdown? Drawdown was edited by, um, Paul by Paul Hawken, but was actually framed by some 200 mm -hmm. um, climate scientists around the world. And they identified and ranked almost 100 steps that would be necessary to take if, in fact, we were to reach our climate goals as agreed in the Paris Agreement of 2015. So, I, we, I decided to include only those women stories who were included in the categories that were listed in Drawdown because it allowed me to um, project if they were successful and other li others like them were successful and the goals were ultimately met that were identified in that book, then I could quantify exactly how many gigatons of carbon dioxide emission equivalents would be saved. So that, after much studying and efforts to winnow the list, um, ultimately got me to about 50 stories that I thought sounded interesting. And then I called Melinda. How many times did I call you? Hello, Melinda, I now have 50. Who do you know of these people? Are they for real? Can you help me meet them? And then I would get temporarily down to 28. And then I would somehow build back up and call Melinda and say, do you know these people? Are they for real? Um, so it was really a collaborative process um, to identify these people. That's wonderful. I would put in a plug for Project Drawdown. They have a website you can go to. It's the rigor of the research is incredible in that group, um, by that group. And 
There's a documentary, which I believe is called Ice on Fire, um, that you could watch. And it, it documents a, a, a lot of the uh, projects that are there. And the name, I think, comes from a researcher who actually lights the ice on fire because of the methane. Um, so it's, uh, it's worth watching. I actually just watched it last week. Um, so that's a small world experience. Um, Avery, you've had just this extraordinary opportunity. And um, I'm wondering if you would share with us one of your favorite experiences from writing the book. Um, I would say one of my favorite experiences about writing this book is actually uh, one of the stories that we mentioned in our speech talk. Um, it's when I visited the uh, house in Tanzania. I would say that was really great because we got to see the Solar Sisters product in action. We got to see um, and photograph a little boy doing homework uh, using the solar portable lamp. Uh, it was also, we got to see um, them milk a cow, which was kind of a cool experience. Um, and yeah, I really like that. Um. So now back to you, Melinda. Climate change um, requires two kinds of actions. Mitigation, so how do we reduce the um, global warming, and then adaptation, which helps people um, live with the effects of climate change. We talked a lot about maybe mitigation efforts in COOL. Could you share a few adaptations? Yeah. And or I did, did I do it? I did it right, right. Yeah, and I, th I think I shared a few of those stories of resourceful, actions um, by WIA leaders. Uh, another one I'll share is in Kakamega, Kenya, which is the uh, where the last remaining tropical rainforest is in all of Kenya. And it has been heavily deforested, um, and the, the community there is really feeling the emergency. And so we work um, in that region, and WIA projects are training local women leaders there to plant native trees on their homesteads and harvest sustainable firewood and launch micro enterprises um, that build alternatives to the logging, which puts a lot of pressure on these communities. And all the trainers are from the region, women who have walked the walk and understand how to really support new women coming into the fold to take on these challenges. And it's really working. In one year, 6,000 native trees were planted and 40 women launched businesses to protect the forest. And based on that success, the Kenyan government plans now to designate an additional 50 hectare parcels of native rainforest for our group there to restore and protect. So that was really exciting. That's great. Um, so if I'll ask a few more questions. But if you have questions, feel free to write them on a card, um, and they'll be picked up. I think we've got a few um, questions already coming. So please continue to have those coming. And um, at this moment, I might see if we could call on a special guest, a family member, um, David Hill, uh, who might want to share something with us. I just don't know where David is seated. There you are. OK. And do you want to introduce yourself as well? Do I need to speak to this? Yeah. Uh, okay. I just wanted to suggest something. The next time we walk along and we see an ant, think about that ant. Because Harvard's E.O. Wilson and others have made the point long since that absent ants, our ecosystem collapses, while absent human beings, it doesn't miss a beat. <laughs> so as far as Mother Nature is concerned, that ant is more important than we are. <laughs> and Paula's book, and Avery's book, excuse me, uh, focus on women who are doing something that brings us closer to alignment with nature. To me, that is the key of this book, that the people we read about, the women leaders we read about, are doing that for all of us. So I just want to make that point. Thank you. And uh, you're also Avery's grandfather, is that correct? <laughs> yes. He said, not a disinterested party. Paolo's husband. I hope we're yeah. all interested observers yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, before we go on to questions from the audience, um, Avery, I wanted to give you the last word, um, which is um, around there are probably um, young writers that will be listening. And I wondered um, if you have any tips for them on writing a book. Um, well, for whether uh, I was writing a book or you know just for my 
uh, school English essays, I usually like to read what I'm writing out loud uh, because sometimes it could just seem like grammatically incorrect or just something I wouldn't say, um, which I do that a lot. I will write something um, and it just wouldn't be me. Um, and yeah, I think that's really important to have in your writing, just you. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, I'll take a few questions. All right. Um, in Spain, um, I think it's, I've learned that installation of solar bonds, installation of solar bonds um, are tax, what? Pan oh, is it say panels? Okay. Um, are taxed. Needless to say, we didn't see, we didn't see many. Um, is this a problem with other sunny countries um, or, or just, um, we didn't see any, we, you didn't see any solar panels, is that correct? That's right, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, the government taxes, the government taxes, taxes this solar installation of solar panels by private individuals. And okay. we ask why, and the reason is that the electrical companies are very much opposed, uh, uh, not in favor of competing with individuals with their own solar panels. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. That is not exactly what you'd like to see in a place yeah. that can generate power for the world. Anyone else on the panel wanted to speak to the solar? Uh, yeah, I mean, just in general, I think that we're going to hear examples of that, but that we're on. Um, a, a, a cusp of great change. There is enormous pressure within corporations and governments to figure this out. And if you don't have a climate strategy, you're going to be left behind. And so I think that we are going to see some slower movement, and, and we're also going to see tremendous transformation in our, in our lifetime. Um, and and we, ha we have to. The, the volume is up. The temperature's up, and um, you know the pressure is on, especially in some of these global convenings where we um, we are going to hold each other accountable, from the individual level to the company level to the government level. I just wanted to add, um, solar. I don't know about Spain but solar is becoming increasingly affordable, and in fact, its price has plummeted. So wind energy and solar are in a position to take on more and more, and the number of job, the job growth in the solar arena is almost twice as fast as the average job growth in the United States. So the potential exists to continue to grow. Um, it's also true that while we are stumbling, that may not be a fair or politically acceptable word, but stumbling federally, while Biden is trying to get climate change um, laws and policies passed, but having trouble doing it, um, increasingly decisions are being made locally and at the state level that are more ambitious and more successful. So it may well be that we'll see that happening um, not at the national level first. Okay, we have a question which I'd like each of you to answer, if you could. Um, what gives you the most hope and courage for more climate action and attention? I love the word courage, by the way. I think it does take courage. Um, it is daunting to see how long this has sat as a very clearly identified issue with virtually no action. Um, I mean, do you remember Rachel and, and Silent Spring and the 1970s and the early conversations about climate change? We knew this was happening and we did essentially nothing. Um, I think it does take courage. I think it takes also personal commitment. Um, and I'm hoping that you all will feel some of that personal commitment as a result of being here tonight. What about you, Avery? Um, wait, sorry, can you hope repeat the question? What gives you hope and courage about people taking climate action? 
Um, well, what gives me hope and courage is seeing uh, young people like myself take action. Um, my school is currently celebrating Earth Week by uh, recycling like old clothes and electronics. And so it's really inspirational um, to see uh, people who might not usually like have the time or resources to create like big um, actions, but they're taking the smaller actions that will um, create a bigger impact. And um, that's just really inspiring and hopeful, uh, brings hope. You inspire me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> I also will say that from that first seed planted by Dr. Wangari Mathai and her Green Belt movement, um, I have been so hopeful to be immersed in, to observe, to be a part of um, people coming together, grassroots, civil society, creating tr change together. and. Um, if I wasn't so immersed in it, I might not realize the power and the transformation that occurs when people go shoulder to shoulder around something and don't try to tackle it alone. And um, I, I think the, the community aspect of this thing, this thing, we're on this spinning ball and we need each other and we are interdependent. And when we can see that, that interdependence and work in sync, and then see the results of that. So my hope is that more people see their part inside of the bigger whole and can not feel alone in the, the task ahead. That's great. It's a good lead in to um, our final little exercise, which is um, it's been an inspiring conversation. We're hoping to do more than just inspire you. We're hoping to get you to move to action. And it's clear that we all have a role to play um, if we're going to make in responding to climate change and making a big difference. So our actions can add up and we all need to be part of the solution. So on your car, on your uh, seats is a pledge card. And what we'd like you to do is spend a minute um, to just think about how to, oh, do you might not have pens, um, uh, to think about what your, oh, she's got some pens in the back, um, to think about what your pledge is and what, what are you willing to do in the next week, in the next year, in the next month, um, because we need urgent action soon. So while you're thinking about what yours are, and um, if we have a few brave people that will share their what they're thinking about doing, um, that would be great. Um, I'll tell you what my three commitments will be. Um, mine is one in my, you could, you could just share one. Um, in my family, I commit to doing the um, exercise um, to finding out what our carbon f footprint is um, and um, working together. I already have some compliant teenagers, which those two words don't usually go together, um, but they understand how much I care about the environment. Um, in my community, I play a leadership role on the Save the Waves board, and we have an event a week from Friday where our community is coming together to figure out how to overcome erosion and how to protect the places that we love. I'm the only non-surfer on the board, but they tolerate me. Um, and then as a citizen, um, I pledge to vote. I pledge to vote. Um, for those um, leaders, like the women that you have uh, highlighted, who will take on climate change. Um, and I think that's a really important piece. To other organizations that I'm associated with, vote.org can tell you whether or not your voter registration is currently active. Um, and another organization, Cal Matters, where I'm an advisor, has just put up their, um, their election guide. So please take a look at those resources. Um, because your vote does matter, and an informed vote is very important. So with that, I'll turn it over and see if we have maybe time for two or three people to share um, what their um, pledge might be. And if we can be quick, that would be great. But if, if some brave folks would like to share, that would be wonderful. Don't make me be like you know the business school person that has to cold call someone. <laughs> Is there anyone that would like to share something that they're willing to do? We have one in the back. I see a hand. Um, I uh, am going to do three things. Um, I think I'll ask the Mill Valley, I'm from Mill Valley, and I'll ask the um, council member that I know um, how close Mill Valley is to zero emissions. And uh, secondly, um, I'm uh, part of a, mm, 
the Mill Valley Stream Keepers uh, local um, 501c3, and I think in our um, communications we'll try to uh, emphasize um, about climate change and. I, I know that one area will be that um, the fish that would normally be able to come up uh, in the stream cannot because of the drought. Um, and um, the city can, uh, if we remove some barriers, they will be more able to. So um, we'll be sure to mention that climate change is a big part of this um, effort. And thirdly, uh, I have committed to write 100 postcards to environmental voters in Colorado um, to be sure to vote um, and in the local uh, elections. Excellent. And we have one more over here, I think, that volunteered. Thank you. Um, I'm inspired to take action. I will work towards um, my diet becoming more plant-based um, and removing meat from my diet in future. So I'm going to university next year, so I think that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, I also want to study environmental science, so I'm going to maybe, well, pro most likely, make that my future goal. <laughs> or aim. Thank you. Thank you. We got one more. Oh, and maybe two. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be switching over to. I already have an EV and solar and power wall, but I will be getting a heat pump and switching my my wa hot water so I'm fully electric. That's one thing I'm doing. And the other is I can help anybody who's here who's uh, invested in mutual funds to understand that you probably may not know it, but you may be invested, you probably are invested in fossil fuels and deforestation. They're all, it's all embedded in all of our systems and all of our 401ks, all of our retirement plans, and to teach you how to actually move your money and also how to vote your proxies. Because there's a lot of climate resolutions at a lot of companies, and it's a really powerful thing that you can do. So I'm happy to help anybody do that. That's what we do, thanks. Right. Uh, could you just share with us what we do? Could you just share your organization? Oh, yeah. I, I run an organization called As You Sow. It's a nonprofit, and we have a site called Invest Your Values that uh, we, we break down every mutual fund into what's inside of it, and um, we update it once a month. Thank you. I think we had one more. I think we have time for one more. Mm -hmm. oh, this is broadly, or it's not really, it's the underpinnings, I think, of more than directly um, affecting, um, specifically affecting climate change. But I do a lot of work and I want to continue to do that um, to support um, women who are um, elected officials at various um, levels, um, city and county and on up to uh, the national level, who um, support voting rights because I think it's so cute, so key mm -hmm. to um, some of the progress that we'd like to see can expand and um, get to be a stronger movement. That's great. All right, I think I neglected this side, so I want to give anyone over here. Yeah? Okay. Sorry, I've been back a little bit. Thanks. Um, as a nurse, um, I'm going to join uh, some other very politically active nurses who are addressing the health uh, issues especially of women um, who are affected by climate change. So um, this is uh, a new venture for me as well. So thank Well, you. thank you as a nurse for taking care of so many of us. So we appreciate your service. Um, I just want to say a big thank you um, again for all of you to make the time. Um, it's also wonderful to be gathered together. Um, and so we thank you for um, joining us tonight and for these inspiring stories that we have. Um, tomorrow when we're celebrating Earth Day, please share um, the inspiring stories and the hope and courage that you've heard about today. Um, and um, we, I also wanted to mention that Cool, the book, is suffering from many of the things that the pandemic is uh, brought on us, which is um, 
the, the book is not yet ready for release, um, but you can pre-order it um, and um, on Amazon, and um, and it would be a great gift. Um, and we are going to have signed pre pre signed or pre up there. What are they called? Book, book plates, plates that you um, that they are happy to sign, and then you can just voila, slide them into your book when um, when the book arrives, um, and you'll have a signed book. Um, and so um, I know that Paolo and Avery are gonna stay and sign some of those, so please make a point to do that. Um, and again, we thank you, and we thank World Affairs. Um, and I would invite you all, um, you've taken one step. Another step you can take is to look to World Affairs um, and to Chris's work on action projects and join others um, who are interested in taking action and working together because together we can make a big difference. So with that, I'd like to thank you all again for coming and get home safely. Thank you. Thank you.